Howdy there once again guys, my name is Ben Ferriolo and it is my aim to eventually go to school for seismology and volcanology so I can kind of become a type of volcanic seismologist. Something Wes Thelen said on his USGS website is, I love earthquakes, I love volcanoes, what better than studying earthquakes on volcanoes? I thought that was really funny. He's a very wise man. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about a few things real quick. To start, please share, subscribe, and like this video, and visit my new website, https colon slash slash monitorsize.weebly.com, M-O-N-I-T-O-R-S-E-I-S dot weebly.com. Now, here is the old faithful webcam right here, pointing towards the upper geyser basin. Now, there are three main geyser basins throughout the caldera. Of course, there are other geyser areas, but the three main ones that I was talking about is the upper geyser basin, which is this one right here, where Old Faithful and this live webcam resides. Norris Geyser Basin, where Steamboat Geyser resides, which is far north of this upper geyser basin, and the West Thumb Geyser Basin. There have been some major thermal changes to the upper geyser basin as of late. If you wish, you may also go to the YouTube channel Mary Greeley if you wish to know more about this event. She's been going more in depth about this, but I'm just going to give you a quick brief overview. And here it is on volcanoes.usgs.gov. And oh yeah, by the way, today is uh, September 22nd, 2018. Right now, as I'm recording this, it is 3 p.m. Pacific time. Let me read this real quick. Oh, by the way, rare ear spring eruption. Yeah, ear spring, which is usually just a spring, erupted. Yeah, it threw out mud and stuff. It was very interesting because last time it happened, they said it was 1957 or something like that. So, in the past week, there have been a lot of changes afoot to the thermal features on Geyser Hill and Yellowstone's upper geyser basin. Ear Spring, a normally docile hot pool, had a water eruption that reached 20 to 30 feet high on Saturday, September 15, 2018. The eruption ejected not only rocks, but also material that had fallen or had been thrown into the geyser in years past, like coins, old cans, and other human debris. The last known similar-sized eruption of the spring was in 1957, although smaller eruptions occurred as recently as 2004. As a result of these changes, Yellowstone National Park has closed portions of the boardwalk. Now guys, I really was hoping I would never see this. All right, undoubtedly the most famous thermal feature in the in Yellowstone's National Park's Upper Geyser Basin is Old Faithful. Geyser Hill is located just across the Firehole River from Old Faithful and hosts dozens of other hot springs, geysers, and fumaroles. Hydrothermal activity at several features on Geyser Hill has changed since the eruption of Ear Spring. Most notably, a new feature, listen to this guys, has formed west of Pump Geyser and north of Sponge Geyser directly under the boardwalk. The feature erupted overnight between September 18th and 19th and continues to pulse water as a small spouter. An approximately 8 foot diameter area of the surrounding ground is breathing rising and falling by about six inches every 10 minutes. Several other thermal features are more active than usual, including geysering and boiling of Doublet Pool and North Goggles Geyser. Changes in yellow... Okay, guys, okay. Just listen to what they say, because what they're about to tell us is completely opposite of what they have told us before. It, I, I don't know. You be the judge. Listen to this. Changes in Yellowstone's hydrothermal features are common occurrences. Really? Okay. I don't remember the last time that changed this drastically, and I hope it doesn't change anymore. I hope it just all calms down, guys. And does not reflect changes in activity of the Yellowstone volcano. What? Uh, okay. Shifts in hydrothermal systems occur only the upper few hundred feet of the Earth's crust and are not directly related to movement of magma several kilometers deep. Wait. Okay, so where do the geysers in the springs get their heat? Hmm, gee, I wonder. There are no signs of impending volcanic activity. That I agree with. I do not see any signs at all. At least right now. That could definitely change tomorrow. There have been no significant increases in seismicity nor broad-scale variations in ground movement. And that is true, too. But that could easily change in the blink of an eye. Like, let's say the magma chamber is starting to expand and grow hotter just a little bit. First, we would see hydrothermal activity first, guys. I'm pretty sure. 
Because as that heat rises and the heat increases, it's going to be pushing up that water a lot more. The outcome of the current changes on Geyser Hill and the Upper Geyser Basin is uncertain. The two most likely possibilities are the area of thermally heated ground may expand and continue to cause changes in hydrothermal activity that persist for years, much like the thermal activity of 2003 in the Norris Geyser Basin. This could necessitate rerouting re re of the current boardwalk configuration. A small hydrothermal explosion okay oh, a small hydrothermal explosion could occur in the area forming a crater a few feet across and ejecting rocks and hot water up to a distance of hundreds of feet, much like that which occurred at Pork Chop Geyser in the Norris Geyser Basin in 1989. Although potential impacts to Old Faithful are unknown, Geyser Hill and Old Faithful have separate hydrothermal plumbing systems and behave independently. And that is true as well. Okay, so, wait, 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 wait. Now, I understand not everybody at USGS is a bad guy, like some people try to make it seem. It is the higher-ups at USGS that make everything political. But sometimes a blatant lie, maybe it's not blatant, maybe some people didn't mean to lie? <laughs> I don't know, doesn't make any sense. But sometimes when there's a lie right to your face, it can make you a little frustrated. You see here where it says changes in Yellowstone's hydrothermal features are common occurrences and do not reflect changes of inactivity of the Yellowstone volcano. They just said for sure, this does not, and I'm not talking about this specific thing right here. They're saying hydrothermal activity does not reflect any changes in any activity of the Yellowstone volcano. That's a lie. I'm sorry, that is a lie. That is a bold-faced lie. Now, I agree that seismicity has been low, but they do realize hydrothermal activity pretty much is volcanic activity. Magma is the only thing that powers geysers, hot springs, and fumaroles all around the world. Do you remember a few years ago when USGS put out a statement saying what, what could be worrying to see at Yellowstone a year or so before an eruption occurs? Well, of course, increased inflation and seismicity would occur, though it's unknown on what scale, but they said one of the first signs as the magma chamber grows hotter and restless is new geysers and even hydrothermal explosions. And people who have been following Yellowstone for a while know that for a fact, that they said one of the main things to watch out for first was increase in hydrothermal activity and large hydrothermal explosions. Now they're saying the hydrothermal explosion that could be coming could be small, but still, they that is what they said to watch out for years ago, didn't they? But it seems now that it's starting to happen, they're kind of going around saying, well, it's not really a sign of volcanic activity. Now, I, I agree, you, you know, it, it's nothing major right now, but it's changing, and they can't lie and say that it does not reflect changes in the activity of the Yellowstone volcano. That's a lie. What would they say if it was about any other volcano? Because some stratovolcanoes do have hydrothermal systems, like Mount Baker here in Washington State steams every once in a while. And, you, and sometimes changes in hydrothermal activity, because guess what is powered by? Magma and a magma chamber. Sometimes that is a sign that something is changing deep below because even slight increases in temperature can cause things to change like this so i really don't know why that they lied right here that is a lie period now explosions are different than eruptions they could be a lot more dangerous and up until this article was published was one of the main warning signs of a coming super eruption at yellowstone caldera now i'm not saying that an eruption is imminent not i'm not saying that but hydrothermal changes used to be the main things the professionals and scientists would tell us to watch out for. Now that it is starting to occur, they completely change their story. Regardless of what is truly occurring, or what will occur, people need to be careful visiting Yellowstone from now on. The whole caldera is slowly destabilizing, it seems. So please, if you visit Old Faithful in the Upper Geyser Basin, or Steamboat Geyser in the Norris Geyser Basin, or any other geyser basin, Please keep your head on a swivel and be extremely careful. Alright, so let's move on to something else real quick. Remember, things can change in the blink of an eye. So here we are at https colon slash slash monitor size dot .com at my blog right here. I got a few new blog posts I want to talk about real quick. They're not too long. Uh, but Mount Shasta did have an earthquake. Look at that. This is the location of the earthquake right here. Now, usually the large volcano is pretty quiet, but not on this day. 
So there's the location of the earthquake right here. And here's the location of the seismic station that I will be using. Seismic station LDL. Mount Shasta, September 21st, 2018, magnitude 2.1 earthquake. On September 21st, 2018, at 2014 UTC, a magnitude 2.1 earthquake at 3.2 kilometers in depth struck directly beneath the southern base of Mount Shasta in Northern California. Seismicity over the past few years has been low, so this could be just an isolated incident. Nevertheless, when seismic changes occur at volcanoes, it is probably a good idea to monitor the area anyway. It is always better to be safe than sorry. The seismogram spectrogram shown above, which is this right here, is from seismic station LDL, broadband vertical NC01, and is of the magnitude 2.1 earthquake that occurred today in Mount Shasta. Well, it's not today, it was yesterday, but you know what I mean. In the first image in this post, which is this one right here, you can see the location of the seismic station LDL. You can see blatant high-frequency characteristics indicative of normal volcano tectonic earthquakes that are seen at volcanoes worldwide. No sign of volcanic activity as of yet, but still should be monitored just in case. If anything changes, I will let you know. The helicorder below is from se seismic station LDL and shows the earthquake near the bottom. Have a great day, guys. And here it is. There's the earthquake right there. One little lonely guy, and this is a telecism. Don't worry, that freaked me out at first, but then I checked it. It's a telecism. Oh, just a heads up, I was having a problem with the comments section uh, for my blog post, but I'm pretty sure it's working now, so. All right, so there is the seismogram spectrogram of the magnitude 2.1 at Mount Shasta. Keep your eyes on Shasta for a few days, guys. Any eruption from Shasta would be pretty large. However, I believe we are far from an eruption, but you never know. So, which volcano in the United States do you think will be next? Please, let me know in the comments below. I want to know what people actually think. Because I'm always constantly wondering which volcano is going to be the next one. Which volcano should I monitor more than the others? Also, on that same day, September 21st, 2018, there was an earthquake swarm in Soda Springs, Idaho. This magnitude 3.2 earthquake was the largest in the swarm, taken from AHID BHZ. On September 21st, 2018, a short-lived earthquake swarm broke out near Mont Montpellier. I think that's how you say it. Montpellier? Montpellier? I'm really bad at pronouncing things. And Soda Springs, Idaho. This location is near the epicenter of the massive late 2017 Soda Springs earthquake swarm, which I have always theorized to be related to magma in some way. I mean, the magnitudes were off the charts, guys. At its peak, it was multiple 3.0s and 4.0s that were shaking the area, frightening all those that lived in the area. We will real quick look at today's swarm and show some data. Please click read more. And I already did that, so. Here are the earthquakes you can see between Soda Springs and Montpellier. As you can see above, the earthquake swarm today, which lasted from about 511 UTC to 1445 UTC, September 21st, 2018, occurred right between Soda Springs and Montpellier, Idaho. Using three seismic stations, AHID BHZ, HWUT BHZ, and Red W BHZ, and cross-correlating earthquake arrivals using the program waves, I deducted there were a maximum of 17 earthquakes within this time period. So it looks like whoever located the earthquakes did a pretty good job. Most of the earthquakes were locatable. As I went through the data, some of which you will see in a second, I didn't notice anything indicative of possible volcanic activity. I'm not saying that I didn't miss something, just that no signals were detected that could indicate possible volcanic activity. However, due to the close proximity to the epicenter of the 2017 Soda Springs earthquake swarm, one that I have always suspected was a case of magma injection, it is good to keep all options on the table until one is disproven. Also, none of the earthquakes in the swarm happen in close rapid succession. Fast-paced rapid succession microquake swarms are something that we have been seeing a lot over the past few years at West Thumb Lake within Yellowstone Caldera. Below is some data from today's Idaho swarm. Since saving images from my website are not the originals, because when you save an image from my blog post and, and, and you save it and you look at the detail, it's pretty crappy and it's not the actual original. You can email me anytime to retrieve this data for yourself, or you can simply click here, click here, for a file download of seismic data retrieved from this event. 
The earthquakes seem to be typical high-frequency earthquakes. Some of the codas, the end tail of an earthquake, however, seem to be elongated just a bit more than usual, especially one specific event shown below. The reason for this is unknown. Since station AHID BHC picked up the arrivals of the earthquakes the best, I will be using that station for any seismogram spectrogram plots shown below, and the analysis images will have a 0.6 Hz high-pass filter. Please also remember to read the captions of the images. All images were created by me using data from IRIS, USGS, and the seismic program Swarm. Go to the More drop-down menu and to find the downloads and the how-tos of seismic programs that I use every day. The how-to menu even shows you how to download seismic data. Remember, you can always email me if you need anything. Here's HWUT BHC. You can see some of the earthquakes here. Here's the teleseism right there. AHID, BHC, you can see a lot of surface noise with this seismograph, by the way. And there's, a, a, I think that's the largest event right there. Red W, BHC, IW, 0, 0. Yeah, I don't know what the heck is going on with this. You can see the largest earthquake in the event right here. But <laughs> something's going on with this seismograph. I don't know what the hell is wrong with it. All right. AHID BHC, uh, that is the station I'll be using for all the seismogram spectrogram plots. The, this shows three earthquakes that occurred in one and a half minutes, the fastest pace during this one swarm. Still doesn't even come close to the fast paced swarms West Thumb Yellowstone is capable of. Here's another seismogram spectrogram plot. Two earthquakes appear in another one and a half minute time frame, still carrying high frequency characteristics. Now, this is odd. I know this is not an earthquake, but even though it barely shows on the surrounding stations, you can tell it has high frequency harmonic characteristics shown on the spectrogram. I'm not saying it's harmonic tremor, guys. I, I highly doubt it is. But because it, look, it, it's got more of a high frequency than a low frequency. Usually harmonic tremor would be down here. But look at that. That is harmonic. You can tell. See those lines? I don't know what it is. And here's a zoomed in view, a closer zoomed in look at this very peculiar event. Almost looks like a heartbeat, doesn't it? Look at that. That seriously looks like a heartbeat. The largest earthquake in the swarm was this one, a magnitude 3.2 earthquake at 11 kilometers in depth. And here's the last earthquake of the swarm. It was reported to be a magnitude 2.3 earthquake at 1.9 kilometers in depth. So this swarm has ended. Since it occurred near the same epicenter as the 2017 Soda Springs earthquake swarm, I would suggest keeping your eyes on this area, just for a little bit. And real quick, here is the last one I'm going to show. Magnitude 2.1 earthquake in South Carolina. Yeah, and there's the location right there with the star between Augusta and North Charleston. The image above shows the location of the magnitude 2.1 earthquake that struck South Carolina at 6.2 kilometers in depth at 747 UTC on September 22, 2018. This area is not known to be seismically active, but they still do occur. I believe right when Hurricane Florence was hitting this area, an earthquake of similar depth and similar size occurred. This earthquake was very weird and had a hard time showing up on local seismographs. The closest seismic station I could find data for was S-U-M-M-V-C-O, which appears to be about 25 miles away, away or so from this earthquake. Below is the seismogram spectrogram analysis of this event, along with the helicorders of the two closest seismic stations. You could tell it barely showed. Nevertheless, it is a very interesting event. High pass filter, 1 hertz, which means every frequ frequency below 1 hertz is hidden. You can't see it. Now, this is done on broadband vertical seismographs a lot because their lines look quote unquote really wavy well that's because broadband vertical whatever shows you know like bhz hhz or the other channels hhe hhn or bhe bhn those detect frequencies a lot lower than short period seismographs do Here's a seismogram spectrogram from SUMMV HHZ NC00. Oh no, I got that wrong. That is not NC. I have to fix that, guys. That is a mistake. It's not NC, it's CO. Whoopsie. So it's SUMMV HHZ CO00 of this magnitude 2.1. One hertz high pass filter was added. 
All right, here is Goga BHC US 00, and you really can't see it at all. And SUMMV HHG CO 00, and the earthquake would have appeared right here, but you really can't see it at all. And I do not know what these are. They are very emergent, which means they slowly build and slowly go away, and they don't show on surrounding seismographs much, so I'm thinking this has got to be some type of surface noise. I don't know. But still, the quake in uh, South Carolina was very odd. That's a very weird characteristics. Well, that's about it for today, guys. If you haven't seen and heard the April 2009 Mount Redoubt eruption in Alaska, please go to my channel, click videos, and check it out. You might want to use headphones, but be careful. It could get quite loud at times. There was nothing really important about it. I just thought it was really cool. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, and visit my website, https colon slash slash monitorsize.weebly.com. Remember, there is no www in the URL address. So, some changes are occurring at Yellowstone in the Upper Geyser Basin. Where will it lead, and how long will it last? Well, that is up to the source of all the heat magma which magma means lava magma is lava but when it's beneath the ground remember whenever you hear the phrase hot spring or the word geyser just know that a magma chamber may lie just beneath your feet we have seen an earthquake at mount shasta an earthquake in south carolina and an earthquake swarm near soda springs idaho near the epicenter of the massively powerful 2017 soda springs earthquake swarm which in my personal opinion only, I believe was a case of magma injection. Injection is the same thing as intrusion, by the way. If the 2017 Soda Springs Swarm was magma intrusion, I believe the magma came straight from the Yellowstone Magma Reservoir. Now, why would I say something like that? Why do I even get close to even believing that? Now, I'll show you guys that soon. I have some images. But according to the GPS deformation data for that time period, there was some large subsidence. Subsidence means deflation, which means the ground goes down instead of rising. And there's, so there's subsidence at Yellowstone Caldera during the same time the 2017 Soda Springs earthquake swarm was occurring. And guess where it was pointing towards? Soda Springs. The GPS data shows large, quick subsidence of Yellowstone Caldera, with the ground shifting towards the southwest at the same time period. Now guess where it leads you going from Yellowstone Caldera southwest into Idaho. Guess where it leads you? Soda Springs, Idaho. You want to know why I believe that it was magma intrusion coming from the Yellowstone Reservoir traveling long ways? I mean, that's that's got to be, what, a couple hundred miles? Well, besides the GPS data showing the way the ground moved, this is the sort of this is sort of the same thing that occurred at Kilauea in May, June, July 2018, this year. When magma decided to leave the Kilauea Reservoir and headed towards the east, I think it's like east-northeast or something like that, guess what happened? Large earthquake swarms, of course, but the ground deformation suggested large caldera subsidence towards the east-northeast, right toward the lower east rift zone in Hawaii. So whenever magma decides to pick up and leave, usually the spot above the reservoir will sink and shift in the direction the magma is flowing. Kind of get what I'm saying? The Kilauea, the Kilauea eruptions prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I believe Kilauea is a mantle plume volcano. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Scott Wheeler, if you're out there and you're hearing this, uh, is Kilauea mantle plume? I'll probably find out uh, by the time I get the video uploaded, but I'm just saying. I think it's a mantle plume and it's a caldera, just like Yellowstone, right? So it could have the same, some, somewhat of the same features, but I believe the magma in Hawaii is a lot less viscous. Viscous means thick, which means it's more runny, it's more watery. The magma here in the United States seems to be more thick. So we will see what happens. Again, if you are visiting Yellowstone, please be very careful, guys. Again, feel free to visit the channel here on YouTube, Mary Greeley. Now, Mary Greeley and I d uh, disagree on some things, but she has a wonderful channel, and I do believe her heart is in the right place. <laughs> You'll never hear her saying that about me. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. Now, I thank you all for your time, and I hope you all have a great day. Remember, I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. That is because the truth is hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. And boy, ain't that the truth. Yeah. God bless, guys, and you be safe. Ben Ferriolo signing off. Oh, 
We got a little eruption going on on... Ooh, I forget which geyser that is. Which geyser is that? That's not... Beehive's right here, so that's not Beehive. Ear Spring, by the way, the one that erupted recently, is back here. I think it's either this one or that one right back there. That one, I don't know which one that is. Well, guys, have a great day.